Hi, boo. Start. Sit up here. Today's first start of the song is me. I put that in a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Well, friends, good morning. Welcome to worship. It's so great to see you here. My name is Evan. I'm the pastor here at St. Paul's and I want to welcome you to worship today, whether you're here in person, whether you're worshiping online with us. We welcome you and are so grateful that you have made St. Paul's a place to worship this morning. Um, I do want to make one quick announcement. Today, it's going to be the shortest sermon ever. Now, I'm taking note of everyone who just clapped. I got to my uh, pulpit this morning, and there's a sermon title in my bulletin. And I won't tell you who wrote it, but his name rhymes with Noni Nanona. My sermon title is, What Makes Tony a Saint? God bless, go with God, you're dismissed. Well, friends, as we uh, uh, begin our service today with announcements, I'm going to invite Melissa to come, our Director of Youth and Family Ministries, to share announcements with us and tell her what's going on in the life of our church as we gear up for our busy fall season. Melissa? Good morning, everyone. If you are new or if you would like to put in prayer cards, they will be collected during our time of offertory. There are the green prayer cards in your pews. We also have connect cards. If you're new or you have some new information for us, you can fill those out and turn those in as well during the time of offertory. Important announcement, today is the first day of Sunday school. Uh, Sunday school will be for younger children, so you have nursery. Uh, They are in the nursery room in the nursery wing, which is right next to the room four. I think think it's one, I'm sorry, it's two and four on the left-hand side. That's for Sunday school. Your middle school and high school students are going to be in the youth room after the children's sermon. So that's when they, they will be able to go. Um, We have a lot of announcements in our bulletin. They're also on, well, they were on the screen behind me, but they don't have to be any, they do not have to be now, Uh, but they are in your bulletin. So if you're looking for interesting things going on, all the new information, we're just repeating that for a while to get you into it. Uh, But something with families, I'm going to have someone come up as, uh, Ryan, why don't you come up uh, since we have a family thing with our nursery, he's going to make a small announcement. Say, Say good morning. (laughs) <laughs> who knows who this is? <laughs> who would like to play with him for an hour? <laughs> we need volunteers for the nursery. First and second service. It's free to sign up. There's no pay, but you get to play with this for an hour. <laughs> Anyone who's interested, please see my wife, Samantha Scott, in the nursery. Thank you. Say goodbye. Say bye. Goodbye. <laughs> That's fantastic. Okay, we have another special announcement. I'm going to leave it up to Amanda. If I could have uh, Trustee President Mr. DeBona come join me up front here. <clears throat> thank you, sir. How are you this morning? I'm doing fine, thank you. How are you? I'm doing well, thanks. Did you know on Thursday we had our choir kickoff? Yes, I did, and uh, it was was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun, and we started with bells, um, and we're in need of some new bell ringers to join our ding-a-ling, so I asked Tony to come, yes, our number one ding-a-ling right here. That's right. But so I thought maybe it'd be helpful if you're on the fence to hear a little bit about the bells because maybe you're not sure if it's for you. So, Mr. DeBona, I have a question. How many years have you been in the bell choir here at St. Paul's? I think it's seven years now. That's a long time. Do you read music? Absolutely not. Hmm. Can uh, can Can you count to 
four? If I take my shoes off. What about six? You're pushing it. Oh, oh dear. He can't read music. He can barely count to four or six. How in the world have you been in bell choir for seven years? Luck. <laughs> now, Tony, if I'm correct, though, this isn't the first bell choir you've been in, right? How many have you been in? I have been in three bell choirs, and the reason why I got started playing bells is uh, my daughters both were in a junior bell choir at church, and they got promoted to the adult bell choir, and I just felt it was a great opportunity for me to bond with my daughters, to have something more in common other than just, you know, school or sports, and it was a great opportunity for both of us to play. We played for about four years together, all, my, both of my daughters, and uh, even to this day, we still talk about it. I love that so much. Give him a hand. Oh, don't go anywhere. So you do not need to read music to join bells. It does help if you can count at least to four, if not six. But what I'm hearing is if Tony can do it. Anybody can do it. Thank you, Mr. Devona. Now, the real best part of this announcement. I'm inviting everybody this Saturday to come out to the parking lot. I know, I know, please, this is going to be fun. We're restriping the parking lot. And the more people we get, the faster it goes and the easier it is for us. So 8 o'clock, Saturday, be there. Thank you. Let's take this time and uh, quiet our hearts and minds with our prelude. Will you please bow your heads with me for an opening word of prayer? Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together. We know that through you, Lord, it can be. It can be for us and it can be for all of those of us united in your son, Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for the son you gave us, the sacrifice he made so that we can live eternally with you and we can all be united as one. We lift up our service to you, Lord, we lift up this time where we will hear his song and praise your name. We will hear your word in scripture, Lord. Let us take it all into our hearts. And as we leave this place today, take it with us into our lives. We lift up today and every day in your holy and precious name. 
Amen. Please join us for for our first hymn, uh, Joyful, Joyful. It can be found in your red hymnals. It will also be on the screen behind me here. Please stand as you are able. child. Yes, you are a child. If you are under 18, you are a child, and you can always be a child of God, so that's also welcome. Oh, we got lots of kids today. It must be something special like the first day of Sunday school. All right. Hello. Hello, everybody. Hello. Hello. All right. So, guys, I have a little fun uh, trivia thing for you, and I'm actually going to act it out for you because I decided to be really brave today. So, nice, right? Thank you. Okay, so you guys, this was one of my favorite children's theme songs when I was growing up, and many people here, they do stream it, so you might be able to see it in reruns, but it hasn't been on for many, many years. So we're going to see if you know it once I start doing it. Okay, can I have my uh, sound guy, Johnny, cue my music? Thank you. It's a beautiful day in this neighborhood, a beautiful day for a neighbor. Would you be mine? Could you be mine? It's a neighborly day in this beauty wood, a neighborly day for a beauty. Would you be mine? 
could you be mine? I have always wanted to have a neighbor just like you. I've always wanted to live in a neighborhood with you. So let's make the most of this beautiful day. Since we're together, we might as well say, would you be mine? Would you be mine? Won't you be my neighbor? Won't you please? Won't you please? Please won't you be my neighbor? Hi, neighbor. I'm glad we're together again. A typo, it's, it always works. Hello, okay, so guys, this is, who knew what it was? What is it? The Tiger, oh, he's in it. What's the name of the show? Daniel Tiger's Neighborhood. Oh, I think there is a new one, right? Okay, I'm behind the times. Thank you, okay. So that's good. There's Daniel the Tiger. We also have the original Mr. Rogers Neighborhood. That's where Daniel the Tiger came from. Okay, so in Daniel the Tiger's Neighborhood and also in Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. So I'm your neighbor, you're my neighbor, you're her neighbor, you're his neighbor, you're her neighbor. Everybody is your neighbor. Your neighbor to this guy right here. He's got a good face on. All right, so that's what we've learned from Mr. Rogers. You can be different, you can be whatever you want to be, and Mr. Rogers always taught about how we all could be each other's neighbor. That's what we can do. So there's also another place where we talk about loving your neighbor. This is where Mr. Rogers got his ideas. He actually got them from scripture. So in our scripture today, we're learning from Romans, and this is from Romans in its chapter 13, and verses 9 through 11, it says, These commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not commit murder, you shall not steal, and you shall not be jealous of other people's things. And whatever other commands may be are summed up in this one command. Are you ready for it? Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to your neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfillment of the law. And do this understanding in the present time. So this is what we have to do, you guys. We have to love each other as our neighbors, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to be very loving, and I'm going to go by, and I'm going to get the high fives to the thing. High five. Give him. Come on, come on, come on. Give me the, give me, 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 give me. Very good. Almost, almost. I almost did it. I almost did it. Yep. Yep. Ow. Yep. 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 Very good. So thank you very much. Yes, okay. This is how we love our neighbors. So let's pray together, you guys, as we unite together as neighbors. Dear Lord, thank you for bringing us together, letting us unite as neighbors here in Christ, letting us know our neighbor doesn't have to live next door, but they can live with us wherever we are as long as we're united in you. We lift this up in your precious name. Amen. Okay, before you go, if you're involved in choir, you can sit back down. If you, you'll know that if you are. If not, you're going to go to the back, and the Sunday school teachers are going to lead you to Sunday school. Can I have that microphone? Yep. Thank you. I think you make an incredible... Well, friends, um, as you know, we've had a lot of change here in our church, uh, really since July 2022, since I came here, and all of our staff members and their roles have changed over the last 13, 14 months. It's a lot of change for our church, and um, I want to thank you, and I'm humbled by your trust in me and our leadership as we've uh, navigated our church through that. Uh, any, any change is an opportunity or challenge for a church, but to have all the staff change in 13 months, is, it's a lot. And so we were kind of waiting until September, and we hit our program year, and some folks who um, uh, were gone in the summer would be back, 
before we had a laying on of hands and commissioning of three of our uh, new staff members. I know two are familiar faces and have changed roles, um, but three new uh, staff members in their roles. And so I'm going to invite Melissa Jensen, our Director of Youth and Family Ministries, Joy Phillips, our Administrative Assistant, and Amanda Roar is our Director of Music Ministries to come. I'm going to invite Bill Propert, one of our lay leaders here, and anyone who's here who'd like to come forward and surround these three folks and lay hands on. We're a lay hands on and pray for you kind of church. So surround them, lay hands on them, and, and uh, join in prayer as Bill leads us in a prayer. You just to reach out your hand, sitting where you are, and to join our blessing circle up here. We come before you, most loving and gracious Heavenly Father, thanking you very, very much for these three ladies, Melissa, Joy, and Amanda. Father, as we reach our hands out and lay them on these people, we pray, Father, that your grace would flow from us to them. Grant them an extra portion of the grace as they lead in ministry here. We just pray, Father, that through this grace, your kingdom would spread and would bring people to joy. We also pray, Father, that your will would be accomplished right here at St. Paul's through Melissa, Joy, and Amanda, just as it is in heaven. And we just pray, Father, for that joy and thank you very, very much. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, we pray through Jesus' name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Before we greet one another, and I know you're itching to do that, uh, one, uh, something before that, I'm going to invite Ann Blaze to come. Ann is our Director of Stewardship here at St. Paul's, and Ann and Tom O'Hearn and I, um, but really, let me give you a secret, it's been Ann and Tom. I, I show up and make the room look pretty, and that's about it. Um, Ann and Tom have been working hard on what's called a narrative budget, and I believe you all received a copy of that with your worship bulletin this morning. If you don't have one, they're available in the back of the sanctuary. You can pick one up there. Um, Ann is going to just share a little bit about this narrative budget, its purpose, what it is, and um, uh, why our generosity story matters. So Ann, would you share this morning? Thank you. Morning, St. Paul's. So, um, first of all, I know we think of the church as this church building where we come together. But in reality, the church is the body of Christ. All the people who accept Christ's gift of salvation and follow Christ's teachings. It is more than a building. In the Bible, church never refers to a building. It always refers to people, the people who follow Jesus Christ. Being part of the body of Christ means we are called to be continually shaped to be more and more like Christ. This happens by letting the word of God the Bible, guide our faith in our lives, excuse me, by worshiping God and celebrating the sacraments that Jesus gave us and by living in community with each other. Becoming a member of the church means that you belong to Jesus Christ and that you belong to the people of God. The presence of Christ is the key to the life of the church. It is in and through the church that Christ encounters, calls, transforms, equips, and sends his people into the world. God uses the church to introduce salvation to those who don't know him and to nurture the faith of believers. The church is God's instrument for expressing his compassion and concern for the world. How do we do that? By your continued generous giving of your prayers, time, talents, and finances. On the generosity report that you've received, we identified five areas of how we grow in our faith, commune together, <clears throat> excuse me, and spread our faith to others outside of our membership. Pastoral ministry, music and worship, mission and outreach, Christian formation and administration. 
Rather than presenting to you where every dollar is attached to a line item on a budget, such as salaries, utilities, mortgage, we are presenting to you a more important view of where your dollars were spent in 2022. I just want to touch on designated giving. Many of you split your giving into separate categories, such as mortgage, uh, unified giving, missions, music, etc. This is not to discourage you from doing so. Specifically, the mortgage and unified giving are separate items and must be contributed individually. But even when you give your general giving, which goes to unified giving, some of it makes its way into the five categories. Now, Tom O'Hearn painstakingly divided the giving into categories by percentage. But as you can see, in the end, all the giving divided into, into the categories ends up being similar in percentage. So for every dollar you give to St. Paul's, 20 cents goes to every category. So you are not just contributing to keeping the lights on in the church or to pay the bills or the mortgage. You are contributing to the life of the church housed within this building. Here at St. Paul's, we are blessed to be part of a growing community of believers. This generosity report really only shows where the finances went. There are almost 20 ministries to support music, missions, and Christian formation throughout every week. We are blessed to be able to come together to worship several times every week. We are blessed to have Pastor Evan to lead us. St. Paul's is making an impact in our community to bring hearts to Christ, show compassion, and be a Christ-like example to those around us. These ministries are you being the body of Christ. Everyone here has gifts from God that they can use to contribute to the church. We know many hours are spent by the leaders and members of these various ministries to further along their missions. We need to celebrate what we've been able to accomplish and encourage each other to go further. So I'd like to invite everyone to our volunteer celebration luncheon, which will be held on the second, after the second service on Sunday, August 24th. September 24th, I'm sorry. It's for anyone who has ever volunteered, is a member of the church, or would like to hear more about volunteer opportunities, and we'd love to if everyone would attend. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing. Friends, let's stand and greet one another this morning. Well, friends, as you come back to your seats, so we're going to unite our hearts in prayer. I'm going to invite Trupti to come and lead us in our morning prayer time. Good morning, St. Paul's family. Good Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we all come before you as your children this morning to praise you with our songs and worship you with a grateful and thankful heart. Father, help us remember that whatever the age or wherever we are at this point in our lives, we are always your child at heart. And you want us to be like a child to enter your kingdom. As the NIV Bible says in Matthew chapter 18, verse 3, Truly, 
I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Father, even though we sin, we drift away from you. Sometimes we are unfaithful to you. Your steadfast love never fails. You forgive us and accept us as we are. You never hold a grudge against us for anything. Today, we pray that you help us to be like a child. Teach us your ways, your compassion, your forgiving selfless love for one another. Purify our hearts, mind, and soul, and help us learn and grow as your good and faithful servants. Grant us patience, wisdom, love, hope, and faith, which we need in our daily lives. You are our creator. You made this earth and everything in it to be good. During these times of uncertainty, chaos, and many things happening in this world, which is out of our control, we look up to you for protection, for your holy intervention, to help us, to help bring order and stillness in this world, as well as in our lives. Help us value our family, our church family, our work family, our neighbors, our friends, our relatives. Father, help each one of us to cultivate a culture of harmony, love, peace, compassion, and forgiveness. Give us strength and courage to overcome the challenges that lie before us. We ask for peace, comfort, healing for those who are broken, alone, hurt, depressed, having financial concerns, have lost jobs, who are struggling with anxiety, health problems, people who are in nursing homes, people who feel lost, people who are trying to make ends meet for their families, and many more. Father, please help them. Make your presence known to them. We ask for comfort, healing for those who have lost their loved ones. Touch their hearts and revive them. Fill the emptiness in their heart with your love and embrace. Make your presence known to them. Assure them that they are never alone and you're always there for them. Father, please come. Fill this place with your holy presence and touch each and every heart in this place and everyone online. Give us a renewed hope each day. Fill our hearts with the spirit of your joy. Help us know that you care. Help us clear the clouds of doubt and fear in our minds and hearts. Teach us to be still so we can feel you, see you through the eyes of faith and listen to your voice. We also ask courage, strength, wisdom, guidance and protection for all children, staff and teachers in the school and colleges, to our first responders, police force, military personnel, and everyone who serves the country. We extend our prayers to all pastors, church leaders, church ministries, persecuted believers. We lift up spoken and unspoken prayers the leaders of our nation and the world, government officials and their teams. We pray for our country and all the nations around the world for peace, love, harmony, and unity. Help us remember, not our will, but thy will be done. And know and believe you are God and the supreme authority. It is said that when two or more are gathered in your name, you are there with them. So Father, we thank you for your loving and living presence in this church and in our lives today and every day. We love you, Father, and in Jesus' name, we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Invite our ushers to come forward this morning as we receive our offering and for the choir to come, our children to come and join the choir for our anthem today. generous God, we give you our thanks for your presence in our lives and your many blessings. Receive these gifts that have been given today. May they be used to bring the good news of Jesus Christ into the world around us. For we pray in his name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing for our hymn of preparation. There's a wideness in God's mercy.
scriptures this morning. You are invited to turn with me to page 982 in your pew Bibles. Our first scripture reading is Psalm 149. Praise the Lord. Sing to the Lord a new song his praise in the assembly of the saints. Let Israel rejoice in their maker. Let the people of Zion be glad in their king. Let them praise his name with dancing and make music to him with tambourine and harp. For the Lord takes delight in his people. He crowns the humble with salvation. Let the saints rejoice in this honor and sing for joy on their beds. May the praise of God be in their mouths and a double-edged sword in their hands to inflict vengeance on the nations and punishment on the peoples, to bind their kings with fetters, their nobles with shackles of iron, to carry out the sentence written against them. This is the glory of all his saints. Praise the Lord. Our second reading. is found on page 1,765, Romans chapter 13, verses 8 through 14. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. The commandments do not commit adultery, Do not murder, do not steal, do not covet, and whatever other commandment there may be are summed up in this one rule, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to its neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this, understanding the present time. The hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over. The day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave decently as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and debauchery, not in dissension and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ and do not think about how to gratify the desires of the sinful nature. This is the reading of the the word. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, as we come to this place, may our desire be to know you more. Help us to put aside the cares and concerns of our daily living and to find in you rest. And Lord, as we rest and as you renew us, may you more fully and perfectly restore the image of yourself that you have placed in each one of us, that we may love you fully, that we may love our neighbors as ourselves, and that we may serve you 
for our good and for your glory. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So I have a question for you this morning. Now, you know I'm a conversational preacher, and when I ask a question, I mean it, so I'm going to offer that, but I'm also going to give a caveat. Please don't give me a book answer for this question, because I know some of you could, and I'd love to hear the stories. But I need, in just a word, or a few words, I want you to tell me, what brought you here to St. Paul's? A job. A job. Aha. <laughs> <laughs> A job? Your parents? I lived around the corner. Carol lived around the corner. <laughs> Your husband, Sue Ellen? Looking for a church home. Looking for a church home. Judy? Family. Family? Children? Wedding. Kyle said a wedding. <laughs> you all better say music up there, choir. That's right. <laughs> Margie? Okay, most similar to the, to the church that you grew up in? You got married here? Bonnie. Your grandkids. Start them here. All right. So kids, grandkids brought you in. Helen. Searching for Jesus brought you here. Tom. You know, I do have a red light flashing on my answering machine. I better listen to that and see who called me. Those are all... Uh, oh, Barbara. Well, last one, Barbara. A Lenten luncheon and Carol Camp. A Lenten luncheon and Carol Camp. Oh. Awesome. <clears throat> all wonderful answers. All important and uh, wonderful reasons that you're here at St. Paul's. You know what none of you said? John Wesley's doctrine of entire sanctification. <laughs> or I read Wesley's sermon on the new birth and I realized I had to be a Methodist. Those may not have been reasons that brought you into St. Paul's. You may not have poured over the journals of John Wesley or fell in love with the theology and the hymnody of his brother Charles Wesley. Or you may not have uh, read the journals of the westward expansion of Methodism under the leadership of Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch. But now that you're here, now that you're here at St. Paul's United Methodist Church, whether you've come because Carol invited you, or a Lenten lunch, or you were searching, or through the family connection you wound up here, all beautiful reasons and good reasons that you're here. But now that you are here, I believe it's important for us to know what it is that this particular expression of the body of Christ known as Methodism believes and teaches. And so over the next six weeks, starting today and going through the middle of October, we're going to have a six-week sermon series called The Wesleyan Way on distinctives of Methodism. I think it's important if, if you were to, to, to unite with, with any church, with any civic entity, if you were to, say, attend this school or go into this career... Wouldn't you want to know something about that thing to which you have committed yourself? And if you're here and you've committed to this church, it's important that you know some of the distinctives of what makes Methodist Methodist. That's hard to say twice in a row. So as we go over the next six weeks, we're going to talk about sin. Somebody said, boy, that's a cheerful topic. Well, you know we got to talk about sin because it's real. And how else do we understand and appreciate the grace of God and His holiness if we don't first understand the sinful condition of human beings? What's the point of grace if there is no sin? So we'll start with sin. We're going to talk about grace. John Wesley understood God's grace coming in four distinct movements. Provenient grace, the grace that goes before and calls people to Christ. Convicting grace justifying grace, and sanctifying grace. So 
So we'll talk about those. That'll be one sermon for all four. So strap into your seatbelts. We're going to move through that quickly. We're going to talk about holiness, which John Wesley said was the grand depositum of Methodism, a reclamation of the holiness of God, and therefore how Christians should live lives and be shaped by holiness. We're going to talk about sanctification. And then we're going to talk about the relationship between our faith and between works. Another distinctive of Methodism. If you're here today, no matter what your religious background is or lack thereof, Methodism is part of the larger Christian family. We believe things that Christians have believed from the beginning of the church. The triune God, that Christ's death and resurrection somehow makes us right with God when we accept that by faith. We celebrate communion and baptism. We believe in that the Holy Spirit can work within someone and sanctify their lives so that they can live lives of holiness. We believe in Scripture as the inspired revelation from God, the authority for a believer's life. Methodists believe all these things, but we do have distinctives. Not that, for example, Baptists or Presbyterians don't believe in sanctification. They do. But in the Methodist movement, which arose in a particular time and place, there were certain emphases that the Wesley brothers had that shaped that particular movement. So as we go through this sermon series, part of it I hope will perhaps be the teacher coming out in me as we learn about our history together. But even more than that, you know, it's one thing to have head knowledge. We can know all about our history and all of that. But what does it mean for our personal and our corporate relationship with Christ together? That's what's most important. So we'll be looking at how we can understand some of these doctrines in relation to our own spiritual lives in our relationship with Christ. There's a great line from one of Charles Wesley's hymns. It says, Unite the two so long disjoined, knowledge and vital piety. In other words, head knowledge and the heart need to come together. If you have just heart and no head, you can be super zealous, but you might not know what to say, when to say it. That tempers the zeal in the heart. And then all the head knowledge in the world without zeal is just empty, dead learning. They both need to come together. And so my prayer is over the next several weeks we're going to do that. On October 15th, the last Sunday of this sermon series, after the second service, I want to have kind of a talkback forum. So you're going to have homework in this sermon series. How's that sound? (laughs) Write down questions. Or things that come up as as we're going through these together that maybe aren't very clear to you. Or maybe you have a burning question about Methodism that you've always wanted to ask, right? I know you all have those. We're going to have a chance to do that after worship on the 15th. So make notes of your questions and we we will get to those. I want to give a very brief overview of Methodism and then we're going to go into our scripture from the book of Romans. Because that particular scripture from Romans chapter 13, gets to an overarching theme in the whole of the movement of Methodism. Something that John Wesley, a lens through which he understood all of ministry and all of life and all of faith. And we'll get to that in just a moment. You have on your screen John Wesley, he's on the left, and Charles Wesley, his brother's on the right. They were two brothers in a family, I believe, of 13 14, Susanna Wesley, their mother, um, nurtured them and raised them in the faith. And in fact, John talked about his mother, Susanna, over and over and over again and really credited her as uh, an important person in his life. She taught them all at home until a certain age and she would spend one hour a day with each of her kids. Oh, sorry, one hour with each of them, but one hour over the course of of a week. Does that math make sense to you? So she would maybe do a couple kids this day and a couple kids the next day, but with an hour individually with each kid, teaching them the Bible. And John said that that really shaped him into who he was. John and Charles Wesley were both priests in the Church of England 
They were Anglicans. And until the day they died, they were priests in the Church of England. Methodism was never intended by John and Charles to be its own denomination. That happened much later and for circumstances and reasons beyond their control. But John and Charles Wesley started this movement as a reform movement within the Church of England. And John and Charles believed that the church um, had an appearance of religion, but it had lost its fire and its zeal. And so this reform movement was to bring that fire of the Holy Spirit back into the church. And so they would get together with these small groups of eight or ten people. It was called the Holy Club at Oxford University. And they would get together and they would pray and they would read scripture and they would hold one another accountable for their sin. And did you know that the term Methodist was originally an insult? It was a term of derision. Because those other students at the Oxford University who were contemporaries and colleagues of John and Charles Wesley made fun of them for how methodical they were in the development of their spiritual lives. And so they were called Methodists, and it was a term of insult, dripping with derision. So the next time you call somebody a Methodist, you're insulting them. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful, you great bunch of Methodists? <laughs> but it stuck. And that methodical approach to the spiritual life, through the means of grace, which John Wesley articulated as reading scripture, as prayer, as fasting, receiving communion, gathering together in small groups for accountability. Those were means by which the grace of God could come into an individual's life and sanctify them and change them and transform them. And so John and Charles were very methodical about their approach to the spiritual life. It wasn't until much later, it was after John Wesley's death, or actually just a few years before his death, that Methodism became a denomination. Why do you think that may have been? I'm looking for good historians, you good Methodists. You don't count, you went to seminary. Somebody brought him a casserole. Well, Pete's getting to the third sacrament that we have in Methodism, communion, baptism, and eating. The Revolutionary War. The Revolutionary War. Who won that war? The colonies, the nascent United States. And you know what that meant for all the priests in the United States or the, the developing United States who were priests in the Church of England? What happened to them? They went back to England. And so there was a vacuum in the colonies. And so John Wesley ordained Francis Asbury and Thomas Koch to come to the United States and to begin the Methodist movement in earnest. And it was in 1784 at the Christmas conference in Baltimore, Maryland, that those first Methodists and, 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 and Thomas Koch and Francis Asbury laid hands on them and ordained them and sent them out to circuits to start spreading this news, this message of God's holiness and sanctification and what His grace could do in the life of an individual. I believe one of the things that we need to reclaim is to understand Methodism as a renewal movement. That it was always intended to be a movement through which the Holy Spirit would come in to places that were dead and dry and revive them with holy love. We need to remember our roots. There were three experiences, before we move briefly to Romans, there were three experiences that shaped John Wesley's life and really three that we need to get our minds around to understand him and who he was in his ministry. These are experiences that would come up again and again and again in his sermons and in his journals. And he would reference to them as watershed moments in his life. The first was when his father Samuel was at Epworth. He was his father Samuel was also a priest in the Church of England. And when he was at the church in Epworth, there was a fire in the rectory. When John was, I believe, six or seven years old. And he <clears throat> barely escaped through a window. 
And he said he was a, like a brand plucked from the fire. And he saw that moment as he was so close to death and the fact that he was saved and rescued from that fire meant that God had something for him to do. He felt a mark of God on his life for a particular and unique purpose coming out of that experience where he barely escaped a fire. The third one was something that happened in Aldersgate in 1738. Now at this point, 1738, John and Charles Wesley are ordained priests in the Church of England. They've had their own parishes. They have come to the United States, to Georgia, to do missionary work among the native peoples. And it was a terrible disaster. Do you kind of know why it was a disaster? There was this young woman named Sophia Hopke that John Wesley kind of liked. But here's something that if you spend time with Wesley that you'll realize about him. He was terribly indecisive. He couldn't make a decision to save his life. And so he would probably sit there under an oak tree in Georgia and he'd take a daisy. She loves me. She loves me not. She loves me. She loves me not. He was so indecisive. She sort of had some interest in him, but with his indecision, she finally said, yeah, well, forget it. And she went after someone else. <gasps> when John's pride was hurt. You know what he did? He refused to serve her communion. And so he got run out of the colonies. I told you this is going to be a salacious sermon series. <laughs> that was some good alliteration. And so they come back to England dejected. They were not received by the native peoples there. John has uh, dealt with this, this uh, romantic interest kerfuffle, and they come back. But something happens all along the way. When they go to Georgia, when they're there, when they come back, there's this restlessness, almost verging on a depression within John. You see, he's ordained in the Church of England. He knows all this stuff. But he says again and again in his journals that he doesn't have any peace. Oh, he talks about salvation, but he doesn't know it and believe it for himself. And so something happened to him in May of, 19, of 1738. He goes to Aldersgate, and this is a bit from his journal. In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society on Aldersgate Street where one was reading Martin Luther's preface to the epistle to the Romans. Okay, so did you get how boring that is? He went and someone's not, they're not even reading from the scripture yet. They're reading Martin Luther, that great reformer, his commentary at the beginning of the epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ. I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. An assurance was given to me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. And thus becomes an important doctrine in Methodism, this doctrine of the assurance of salvation. You see, often in Methodism, we'll, people will make appeals to John Wesley and they'll use the word experience that John Wesley talked about experience and how important that is. And that's true, but this is the experience he talked about that could be available to every believer. Not just any experience in life, but an experience with the Holy Spirit, witnessing with your spirit that you are indeed a child of God. John Wesley believed that after it happened to him, and that became a watershed moment in his life, that a believer can have assurance that they are indeed saved. The third thing that happened to John Wesley was just a few months later, on New Year's Day, 1739, at a place called Fetter Lane. Now, early Methodists would get together New Year's Eve, and they would stay up all night praying. You want to do that this New Year's Eve? They would stay up all night praying, and this is what he said happened. He named several people who were with him, among them George Whitfield, the great evangelist. My brother Charles were present at our love feast in Fetter Lane with about 60 of our brethren. About three in the morning, as we were continuing in prayer, the power of God came mightily upon us, inasmuch that many cried out with exceeding joy and many fell to the ground. As soon as we recovered a little from that awe and amazement, at the presence of his majesty, we broke out with one voice. 
We praise Thee, O God. We acknowledge Thee to be the Lord. So John Wesley, his life shows us a pattern that happens over and over again and a pattern that he sought to instill in his early Methodists. That after an experience that brings the peace and the assurance of God, there often is a subsequent experience with the power of God that allows people to be empowered for ministry. Because after that event, on January 1st, 1739, if you read John Wesley's journals, you know what happened? Incredible miracles happened. He'd pray for people and they were healed. People were delivered from sin, from depression, from anxiety. More and more and more people started to check out who these Methodists were. He began field preaching which was terribly controversial in the 1730s in the Church of England. He went outdoors and took the gospel to people because he had an experience with the peace, which led to an experience with the power, and that changed everything for him. And it can be the same for us. These don't have to just be stories that we read about in the lives of early Methodists. The same is available to each one of us. The same Holy Spirit that met John Wesley at Aldersgate Street and then at Fetter Lane, giving him peace and power, is available to each one of us. In the epistle to the Romans that Tammy read briefly for us today, I want to just remark very briefly on a word that you find in that scripture. When Paul's writing to the church in Rome, he talks about love. And he names commandments, doesn't he? And how it all is summarized. Or it all finds its perfect fulfillment in love. Love of God and love of neighbor. John Wesley, over and over again, that that narrative that is overarching over the whole Methodist movement is a concept called holy love. And that qualifier is important because it points us to holiness. It points us to God. See, you and I can talk about love all day. And isn't that a word that's bandied around in our culture so often? Love is this. Love is that. Love is love. Da, da, da. But without a qualifier to that love, without an interpretive lens through which we can understand it, that just tends to be so much noise and just a word. We need definition put to it. And in Scripture, we do have definition put to it. We have a person that is put to that word. We have a perfect example of love to follow. And it is holy love. See, this is where holy love is important. That qualifier is important. The holiness of God means that some things are okay and some things are not okay. The holiness of God gives shape to our lives. We realize that there are certain things in life that lead us to holiness, that is right living, right action, right orientation toward God and toward others. And there are other things that get in the way of that love that are not holy, that are not right, that are not good, that are not part of God's design for our flourishing and our relationships with Him and with one another. And unless we have an understanding of His holiness... Our enacting of our love will constantly miss the point because we need Him working through us to live out that love in the world around us. And so Paul says there are a couple of ways that happens, positively and negatively. You put on Christ and you put off the flesh. You put on Christ and put off the flesh. We find that over and over and over again within our own movement. This idea that, that Jesus doesn't just sort of make us right in God's eyes, oh, he certainly does do that. But it doesn't just end there. He actually gives us his very self, his very life that can change us and radically transform us. We don't go around with just good ideas about Jesus. We go around with Jesus. He's with us, even now, allowing us to live lives of holy love. Friends, take with you today this truth. 
you too can live a life of holy love. When you encounter the peace that comes through the assurance of the Holy Spirit saying to you in your spirit that you are indeed a child of God. And then you can also live a life of holy love out in the world when you encounter the power which happens when the Holy Spirit starts to work in you and change you and transform you, allowing you to live the life that God wants you to live. Friends, this is the richness of who we are as Methodists. We claim it. We believe it. And it can change our lives today. Amen? Amen. Friends, let's stand for our closing hymn. Blessed be the ties that bind. You'll find it in the red hymnal and on the screen. God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us that which is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And all the people of God said, Amen. Amen.